Yeah. Okay, so next up we have King Ming, who is an IoT engineer at SP Digital. He will be showing us how to build a virtually undetectable malicious compiler. So let's give King Ming a hand. Okay, uh, X. Okay. So uh, most of us, when we deal with uh, compilers, this is the contract we expect it to have, right? We pass our code to the compiler, and the compiler is supposed to generate a binary that behaves the same as what we expect it to be. However, what happens if this contract is broken? Okay, so let's put that aside for now. First, why this title, uh, Reflections on Trusting Trust? It can be traced back to these two guys, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. So both of them, because of their work on the Unix operating system, they won the 1983 Turing Award, which is roughly equivalent to the Nobel Prize for Computer Science. So as a privilege of winning this award, Thompson could have the privilege of presenting on any topic of his choosing. And he chose to present on this topic called Reflections on Trusting Trust. Okay, so in his opening statement, he said, to what extent should one trust a statement that the program is free of Trojan horses? Perhaps it is more important to trust the people who wrote the software. Okay, to understand why he said this, let's take a look at this problem. How do we know that a program is safe? Right, so maybe we can inspect the program source code. But the program source code is compiled by a compiler, right? Okay, so maybe we can inspect the compiler source code. For example, the Golang compiler source code at this repository. Then the next question is, the compiler is compiled by another compiler, right? So uh, for the case of self-hosting compilers like Go, the Go compiler compiles itself. So, how deep do you, do you want to go down this rabbit hole? Okay. So let's take a look at some real-life compiler attacks. For example, Xcode goes. So what it basically does is that you inject spyware into the output binary. And another one is the induct A virus. So what it does is that you inject, you will create a botnet from those output binaries. And if this output binary sees another Delphi compiler, you will in, in, infect the Delphi compiler to do the same thing. So this proves that this is not just academic exercise. There are real life compiler attacks out there. Okay, so in this presentation, what do I want to do? So I want to create a malicious compiler to target a program. For example, a login program. Then I do not want to leave a trace in the compiler source code. At the same time, I want to subvert verification. I don't want the user to easily detect this. So in this presentation, uh, I'll, have, I'll go through more stages because in, in the Thompson's original presentation, he went through several stages of proof. Okay? So the first stage is the concept of the self-reproducing program called the queen. So the, the, this is the definition of a queen, a source program that when compiled and executed will produce as, as output an exact copy of its source. Okay, so let me show you an example of a queen. Okay, so this is a, as a queen example that I've written. So let's try to run it. Okay, so let me run this uh, queen program. See what output does it generate? I mean, you can compare the output here and the source code here. They, are, they look the same, right? So if you don't believe that they're the same, let me uh, redirect the output to a file and I do a diff. Okay? So they are exactly the same. The output of this program is the same as its own source code. Okay? So that is the first stage. So now let me go to the second stage, which is the concept of a compiler knowledge propagation. I want to pass down knowledge through several compiler iterations. Okay, so I'll first introduce my clean compiler. Okay, so uh, obviously I did not write a compiler from scratch. I'm not good enough for that. So what I actually do is that, okay, the user will pass in the file name of the code that you want to compile through the compiler arguments here. And then my program will pass the text over to the actual Go compiler behind the scenes. So I'm, in a sense, I'm cheating a bit. Lah. Okay, so let's see. So, Okay, so let me build my current, my, my current Go compiler. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so how do I test whether my compiler works? So let's uh, use a very simple program called the Hello World program. Okay, no explanation needed for this. Okay, so I'll get use my, uh, my compiler to compile this Hello World program. Okay, so uh, my compiler will generate a binary. At the same time, you also print out the source code that is compiling. So the implication of this you will see later. So let me run the Hello World program. Okay, it works. So my compiler works. Okay, so now let's say we want to teach the compiler new things. Okay, so let's say I, in my Hello World program, I've modified it. Instead of using the word import, I use fetch. Okay, 
So what happens if I try to use my compiler to compile this program? Okay? So the compiler will have, issue, will have a compile time error because it does not recognize this fetch keyword. So why not uh, we train my compiler to recognize this new keyword? Okay? So uh, what it does behind the scenes is that this is my new compiler. It will replace the word fetch with import. Okay? But in the sense, is I'm actually training it to recognize fetch. Okay. So now let me uh, compile my new compiler, okay, and I try to build the fetch program, and it works now. And notice behind the scenes, it has uh, converted the word fetch to import. Okay, so now let me run this new program, and it works. Okay, so now my compiler can recognize this new keyword. Well, what can we do from there? It, so since now the compiler can recognize this new keyword, right, fetch, right, the compiler's own source code can now utilize this new feature, fetch, here, okay? So now I get my existing compiler to compile this new compiler, okay? And notice that behind the scenes, it has replaced the word fetch with import, okay? And I, now I get my new compiler to compile the Hello World fetch program, and it works. So what I've shown you that the compiler has now is able, okay, the, the concept of compiler bootstrapping, lah, okay? So as a summary of what just happened, okay, so we started with the Golang compiler. So I passed I pass my compiler source code to it, to generate my compiler. Okay, so to test it, I pass the Hello World program to it, and it works right initially. But when I try to pass in the Hello World program with the fetch keyword, it couldn't work. So I have my new compiler source code that can recognize the word fetch, and then I compile it with my existing compiler. Okay, and then I pass the Hello World fetch source code to it, and it can work. Okay, so I further improved my compiler by the compiler's own source code using the word fetch. Okay, so it works now. So this is the summary of what just happened. Okay, so what have we learned so far, right? So I've shown in the queen that the program can output another program, inclu including itself. I've shown in the concept of compiler bootstrapping. When you first, the compiler implements a small sub subset of the features of the language, then once it can recognize more features, the compiler's own source code can adopt these new features. Okay, so now let's come to the attack, right? I want to add an undetectable backdoor to a login program. Okay, sorry. So I'll first show you uh, my login program. Here, okay. So this is what my program, uh, my login program does. So the user will pass in the password via the command line arguments, and then you compare it against a list of uh, correct passwords. So if the password is correct, you print out password correct. If not, you print out password wrong. Okay, so first I'll build my login program. Okay, so uh, I'll test it with the correct password, Punky. Okay, so it prints password correct. So now if I pass in a wrong password backdoor, it will print out password wrong. Okay. So let's say if I'm the hacker, right, I want to eat, put my own password inside. So I modify the login program source code. So this time, right, I add this. If let's say the if the program sees a password backdoor, you print out password correct. Okay, so let's try this. Okay, so if I, I pass it the, the backdoor password, password is correct. Okay, so now we have this problem. Whoever sees the source code of this login program, right, will immediately know something is wrong, right? I mean, if you see this, you know this is a backdoor password. So what can we do, right? Uh, we can possibly, instead of putting the code here, we can put the code at the compiler side. Okay? So here, okay, here. So this is my modified compiler source code now. Whenever it sees that it is trying to compile the login program, it will inject this text in. So remember this text, right? This is the backdoor text, okay? So let's try this. Let me build the, this new, this malicious compiler here, okay? And I use this malicious compiler to compile a clean version of the login program without the backdoor. And notice what it has done to the code, source code. It's injected the, this, back, this malicious code in. So let me run this, okay? And it works. And this is supposed to be a clean version of the login program, All right? Okay, so now we actually have another problem because whoever sees the source code of this compiler, right, will immediately know that this is malicious. Yeah, so is there a way to further hide this? Okay, so now I bring you another iteration of my compiler, okay, which is here. 
So what does this do? Okay, so whenever it sees a login program, it will still do the same thing. It will hack the login program. But in addition to that, whenever that it sees itself here, you inject this. So that its own children is able to carry out the same attack. Okay, so let me do the demo for this. See, so I shall call this compiler hack itself. Okay, I build it. And then I ask it to build the login program. Okay, so notice that it has done the backdoor thing. And it still injected the backdoor in. So now, the difference this time is that I'll ask the compiler to compile itself. And this is the clean version of the compiler source code without the backdoor. Okay, and you see what happens. It has injected all this code in inside here. Right. Okay, so now let me run it against the login program again and notice that the hack still works. This is the second iteration of the compiler already. Okay, so uh, just a quick summary of this stage. So I have my malicious compiler source code. I pass it to the, the typical Golang compiler. I pass a login program to it, source code to it. You generate a malicious login program. And if I pass a clean version of the source code, a clean version of the compiler source code to it, you still generate a malicious compiler, which is also capable of hacking the login program. Okay, so now uh, if the user is smart, right, probably he would think, maybe I'll try to verify the SHA sum of this program, of the compiler binary. So for example, the SHA sum of uh, this compiler on my Mac is this value, 53B3. Right, 53B3, it starts with this. Okay, and if I try to check the char sum of my malicious compiler, it's different. So immediately the user will know that, okay, there's something wrong with this compiler already. So, so the next question is, can we prevent the user from detecting the bug compiler, right? So the, pro the thing is, the SHA sum program is just like another program. It's just like the login program. Who is to say we can't hack that as well, right? <laughs> okay, so, okay, sorry, I'm going too fast. Okay, so let me show you the SHA-256 program that I've written. Okay, 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 I, I, I cheat a bit, I call the standard library. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, because I don't have the source code of what Apple uses, so I have to roll my own version. Okay, so what it does is very simple. You take in the source, uh, sorry, you take in the file name of the, the file that you want to check, and then you run it against the SHA-256 algorithm and print it out. So let's see, right? Okay, so let, let me first build my SHA-256 program and I shall test it against the actual Go compiler and generate the same value, 53B3. Okay, and I test it against the malicious compiler, it starts with 129. So it proves that my implementation of SHA-256 is the same as that, as the one in my Mac. Okay, so now let's try to hack this SHA-256 program. So whenever it, it sees that you're trying to check the SHA sum of the compiler, you return the value 53B3, which is the actual char sum of the clean compiler binary. Okay, so let me run it. Okay, so I run it against the typical Go compiler and it's correct, 53B3. If I try to run it against my malicious compiler, it generates the same char sum value, right? So the user is unaware that the compiler has been modified. Okay, so so in the, this midpoint of my presentation, I shall talk about what Thompson concluded. Okay, so you, basically you can't trust code that you did not totally create yourself. And uh, no amount of source code verification or scrutiny will protect you from using an uh, untrusted code. So I've shown you in this presentation that even if the login program looks clean, the SHA-256 program looks, looks clean, then the compiler source code looks clean. But if the compiler binary is the one injecting all this code everywhere, you basically cannot trust anything. <laughs> Okay, then if you, uh, if you don't want to use the compiler, you can always use tactics like hacking the assembler loader or microcode. You can go even lower. So the, his final conclusion is that you always have to trust somebody. Okay, so that was in 1984. Okay, so is there a possible defense against this? Okay, so it took 25 years for someone to come up with defense against this. So this is actually uh, this concept called diverse double compiling. So he, this was put forward by David Wheeler in his 2009 PhD dissertation. So what is this? Okay, so the objective of his uh, DDC is to detect this trusting trust attack of a malicious C compiler. Okay, so in 
Okay, so this is his requirement. You need another compiler in the process. And the source code of the compiler needs to be available. Okay, so this is the process. We assume that we have these two compilers, GCC and TinyC. We suspect that GCC is malicious and we want to know. Okay, so we have these two definitions, the compiler under test, GCC, the independent compiler, TCC. Okay, so this independent compiler can be anything. It can be small, it can generate inefficient code as long as it works. Okay, so we start off with GCC. We pass the source code of GCC to this binary. You generate another compiler binary. We pass another version, uh, uh, same version of the source code to this generator binary. You generate another binary. So the rationale is that we want to do a control check. These two must be the same. Okay, so we bring in the independent compiler TCC. We pass the source code of GCC to it, you generate a binary. And we do the same thing, you generate another binary. And these two have to be the same. Because these two, they are semantically equivalent. Right? They may not be binary equivalent, but if you pass the same source code to two semantically identical programs, the output must be the same. Okay? So why it works? So TCC, this one, can be malicious. But it's more likely to be malicious to itself than to malicious to another compiler. Then, if the hacker has, wants to be successful, right, he actually has to compromise GCC and TCC to hack each other, which is a tougher work to do. And another thing is, is that this uh, independent compiler can be actually very small, so it's easier to verify its source code and its output binary, and its own binary. And if you still don't believe that TCC is clean, right, we can always bring in the third independent uh, second independent compiler like Intel. And Okay, so in order to be successful, the hacker actually has to compromise GCC, TCC, Intel, and then to hack each other. Then this process can be subverted. So to the hacker, right, it's actually an ON square problem for them. It's much harder. But for the defenders, they just have to secure all the compilers. Okay, so let's come to Go, right? So just now the example was for C. In Go, there are only three, these three Go compilers. And, but most of the time, we only use the first one. Now. So the size of N for Go compilers is one to three, depending on how you look at it. It's a very small number compared to C, which has plenty of compilers. So the size of N is very small, right? So if hackers can somehow compromise all these three, I think we are in big trouble already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is there, is there a possible solution for the Go side of things? So I was thinking about this. Uh, maybe the solution may not be in the present, but it could be in the past. So, so let's take a look at Go 1.5, which is like released in 2015. Okay, so Go 1.5 is actually the first version of Go that is com completely written in Go, right? And so you can see in the release note, C is no longer involved in implementation. So the last version of Go that's written is, Go compiler written in C is Go 1.4. That was in the previous year. So you can see, right, in, if you, let's say you want to bootstrap the Go compiler from scratch, you need Go 1.4. You can see in the notes. Okay? So this is summary. So maybe you can try to re if you do not trust the existing Go compiler, you can uh, rebuild the Go 1.4 compiler with the existing C compiler that you have. Then after that, you build the latest version of Go with Go 1.4. Yeah. Okay. So even if let's say this C compiler you use is malicious, right? I I think it's doubtful that you will try to affect the Go compiler, la. Uh, But uh, we can't say. Uh, I can't say that that's the case, uh. <laughs> Okay. So. So I shall leave you with this question. Uh, do you still trust your compiler after I give this talk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's all. Thanks. I still have Got questions now? Got them. Okay. Okay, uh, there's one question. So, King Meng, what or who do you still trust? Uh, well, no one except yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, but in but in all seriousness, right? Uh, you still have to basic, basically trust, like for example, Google, like Rust Cox is here. <laughs> so I assume we all have to trust him that you generate the correct Go binaries and they're not generating malicious binaries. Whenever we call the, the Go compiler, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we still have a bit more time. Does anybody have any other questions? No? 
Okay, uh, I use a tool. Okay, let me show you. Uh. So I use a tool called Demo Magic. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I use a tool called Demo Magic, so you can see here. Okay, these so are the commands that I type. Right, I basically just put it here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this this thing is open source. Yeah, but written by someone. I just used it. Yeah, this one? Okay. Okay, that's all we have. All right, let's thank Ming again. Okay. Uh, next